Hello guys, thank you so much for joining to this live session. Uh, my name is Hamita Sanzadeh. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Parametric Architecture Platform. And uh, I'm super fired up about today's live session. Uh, we are really in a great company today. We have Mr. Moshe Safdi joining to our live session from Boston, Massachusetts, United States. In a couple of seconds, I will invite Mr. Safdi to join to this live session. But before going to that, I will go in very in a short introduction. But uh, and also, guys, if you have any questions to ask from Mr. Safdi, please write them in the question box down below, and I will ask them from Moshe Saf dear Moshe Safdi. Okay, Moshe Safdi is an architect, urban planner, author, educator, and theorist. He is the author of four books and a frequent essayist and lecturer. Safdi's global practice includes projects in North and South America, the Middle East, uh, developing countries, and also throughout Asia and Australia. Some of his projects are Habitat 67 in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, uh, Marina Sands Bay in Singapore, Art Science Ming Museum in Singapore, Jewel Changi Airport also in Singapore, and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, and uh, many more amazing projects that you have seen in magazines and social media. So I'm inviting Mr. Moshe Safdi to, to join to this live session. And there we go. Hi. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining to this live session. Good to good good to be with you across the oceans and Thank the you continents. So much. Exactly, exactly. That's great. Thanks for accepting our interview request. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you. And uh, if you want to say hello to our audience, please, the mic is yours. If you want to say hello. Hi to everyone in whatever continent you are. <laughs> Greetings from Boston. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. So uh, as we start, uh, would you please uh, talk a little bit about your journey of becoming an architect and also establishing your office, Safety Architects? Well, this is a long story because it's now half a century ago. But uh, I was born in Israel. I grew up there, and I, uh, we, my family immigrated to Canada when I was 15. I studied architecture at McGill, and then I got a traveling fellowship to go and study housing uh, across North America as a student, and that led me to do a thesis about a three-dimensional housing system. To cut a long story yes. short, I went to work for Lucan. Montreal got a World's Fair. I was invited to head the master plan team. I proposed my thesis as one of the pavilions and Habitat got built. So 1967, to do Habitat, 1964 actually, I opened an office to do that project. And that was the beginning of my practice. Um, and you were 25 then, that year, right? You were I was 25, 25 when I opened what? my office. And I was 29 when we completed Habitat. Then there were a series of habitats that didn't get built. 1978, I relocated to Boston to head the urban design school and moved my office to Boston where it is still today. And we are now in one of the two buildings that uh, constitute this office, walking distance from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. That's brilliant. Great, awesome. So talking about today's situation and the uh, situation with the pandemic COVID-19, how did you react to this pandemic and your office also? And uh, how do you think this will change and affect our relations, lifestyle, architecture in the future? Well, first it was a shock like it is for everybody. And uh, all 80 of us or 90 of us uh, started working from home. I have to say, surprisingly efficiently uh, we managed to continue being productive the most difficult thing is when you start a new design when you start a new design you want to be together with the team you want the model makers there you want the whole thing the synergy of it but if you're doing you know development drawings it's easier so now we're finding with a couple of new projects and competitions that we're doing that it's tough and we nice. are back here trying to improvise the lessons for cities are, are, we still don't understand them. I think first seeing the cities without congestion, with clean air, uh, questioning densities, you know, how far, how high is too much uh, density? 
uh, I have a friend in New York. Uh, she's a city planner. She lives in a luxury building. Uh, about a month mm-hmm. into COVID, she she called me and she says, you know, I'm in a luxury building. I can't open my, can't open my windows and I don't have a balcony. From now on, there has to be a law. Open windows and everybody must have a balcony, which reminded me of our own slogan for everyone a garden. Every house should have a garden. Yeah. COVID yeah, is garden, just reinforcing, yeah. reinforcing our convictions. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. So it's been more than, I, I will go back to Habitat actually. It's been more than half a century that you have designed the Habitat 67 project. Uh, with this project, you have just changed the landscape of the residential projects and also it's made everyone to change the way they look at to the residential architecture typologies from the points of building techniques, diagrams, and many more things actually. With this project, you have gained the international fame when you were 25. How do you think this project has changed the, your architecture career and the way you do architecture? Well, it's been cycles because building habitat opened doors and we had many commissions, but we couldn't get them built. We could not get the Habitat New York, Puerto Rico built. There was too much resistance. So for several years, we were very much engaged with cultural buildings, uh, performing art centers, many museums. But, um, you know, my first love, housing, we could not really take on. And this changed completely about uh, 15, 20 years from ago, where all of a sudden, particularly in Asia, the growth of cities, the greater densities, uh, maybe more ambitious uh, developers, all of a sudden we were able to realize the ideas of habitat. Not only that, it's a pleasure for me to see the next generation of architects embrace these concepts and these ideas. And... uh, and start looking for ways to fractalize the high-rise buildings, to uh, to create gardens and terraces and outdoor spaces. So it's come full cycle. Now we are able to realize what we had proposed uh, 50 years ago, but there was a big struggle in between the two. Yeah, yeah. Was there uh, other like challenges you wanted to build these t- kind of like other than America, you, you wanted to build habitat-like residential projects other parts of the world? Well, of course, having our like, office... Like in, inspiring from habitat. Yeah, I mean, we're doing this in Singapore and China, but I would love to be able to apply this in, uh, in North America where we live. <laughs> uh, things are more difficult here, less adventurous. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you see projects like uh, Hudson's Yard go up in New York and you say, oh, my God, right. what this could have been, what this could have been. <laughs> exactly. That's right. So when we look at your your work, most of them are large scale projects like airports, like skyscrapers, uh, large scale residential and many more. How do you ensure to capture the human scale in these projects? In other words, how do you humanize these mega scales and yeah you know no matter how big a project and somehow we have been involved with very large ones you've got to break it down you've got to come down to the individual personal experience so you know marina bay sands is probably uh, six seven million square feet uh, uh, and yet it breaks down into the streets and the gallerias and the promenades and the atria and the parks and the sky park. And in each place you are breaking down to give scale. And the same thing, we are just completing a very large project in Chongqing, uh, Raffle City, Chongqing, 10 million square feet. And this, the whole mission is how to create how to break down the scale, how to create intimacy, how to create privacy in certain parts, how to create public life in other parts, and how to bring nature into it, open view. So it's, it's dozens of components, all of which have to do with the individual experience, feeling comfortable and not overwhelmed. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to, when the scale goes up, 
it's really hard to th that users get engaged with the building and get the the, 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 the proper experience that they should get. So uh, do you think your projects just made great experiences for the users? I could say that I believe that because I get feedback. When we opened Jewel in Singapore, which, where we try to show that you can have a major airport with big commercial development and a great big garden like no one has experienced before, where you can integrate nature with commerce and transportation, the feedback was extraordinary. I mean, the first day that opened, we had a quarter of a million people. The next day, we had 600,000 people. That was because people were responding. So we get, we get that positive feedback. And they have, for an architect, that's the most rewarding thing of all, is to just get that feedback. I do believe that, uh, that you learn from that feedback. And then you go further and build upon what you've experienced. So after Jewel, what we do next will have benefited from that experience. After Marina Bay, we went on to other projects that benefited from that experience. So, right, right. Uh, in this current age, because of the globalism, most of the architectural projects have uh, no context, or if they have, it is really weak. What I mean by that is if you put, if you bring the, uh, that project from New York and put it in Beijing, it just looks the same and it doesn't belong to anywhere in the, in, in the world. So uh, with, with, with having in this in mind, like the same type of the glass tower is being everywhere in the world, how do you criticize the situation? Also, what is the importance of context in your project? First of all, context is completely central. I think that uh, in terms of the f basic principles of architecture that I really believe in, apart from, you know, the, 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 the technology of construction, the response to the program of a building or the brief, as some people refer to it, the, the location, the place, the culture, the topography, the climate is fundamental to the making of architecture. Now, there's different levels to it. If you think of a glass tower, you think of it in Dubai, you think of it in Montreal, uh, you know, it goes from, nine, uh, from uh, 35 or 40 degrees uh, uh, centigrade, it goes to minus 40 degrees, the same glass tower. Exactly. If you think exactly. of uh, the trees, you know, the vegetation in the desert is very different from the vegetation in, in, uh, in you the, know, north. The, the cold climate. I think towers should look as different as the trees or the plant life in that location. I mean, doing a tower in a, in a desert hot climate is about shade, is about evaporation, is about air, and doing one in a place like Montreal is about changing from summer to winter, from heat to cold. And just like trees and plants transform, I think uh, towers architecture should change over the seasons even. But at a deeper level, because we've done many national and cultural buildings, uh, like the, Na the National Museum of the Sikhs, the Khalsa in Punjab, or the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, uh, uh, Yad Vashem, or the Museum of American Art in Arkansas, there you go even right. deeper into not just climate, but you go into culture. How do you make a building that the Sikhs feel belongs to their heritage, to their history? How do you make a building uh, in Arkansas with a tradition of the Midwest and wood construction? So you need to put out your antennas and understand the culture, the history, the even I would say taste of the people in a sense uh, and try and embody that into your architecture. For that reason, the idea that uh, there's some signature style that I take from the Punjab and bring it to Beijing and then do it in Arkansas doesn't work for me. It really is about trying to feel the essence of place. And to me, we have to do that to counter globalization because the sameness that we feel now everywhere, I mean, the same mall, the same brands, uh, you know, you're going to airport, you have no idea. When we did the- Yeah.
Do you hear me? Do you Moshe Safti? I hear you. I hear you. Okay, I think we lost uh, a couple of seconds for uh, your voice. Are you? It's can okay. you hear me now? I hear you now. Because I see it's we're perfect. off the I hear you now. Okay, good. Okay, great. That's great. So, uh, what are some upcoming projects that you're working on? Uh, we're working on a very interesting project for Facebook, although I can't go into the details yet. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, very interesting project. We're doing a major expansion to the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art because it's been uh, very successful and we're expanding it. Um, we're embarking on uh, a project in China, but we also have several projects nearing completion. Uh, medical school, the Albert Einstein Medical School in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, we're soon to open a hospital in Cartagena in Colombia. Uh, so very exciting, uh, excited about these soon to be finished projects. We've just completed a residential 65 story tower in Colombo in Sri Lanka. Impressive, impressive, brilliant. I will get one of one question from one of our audience. Uh, uh, Soli asks, uh, which one of your projects you are proud of and why? So uh, the question uh, would be, which one of your children do you love the most? More, yeah, yeah, most famous. So I have four <laughs> and I love them all. Uh, I would say, I would say that I could not choose I mean, one project. from the pro projects like which are more like to you, to the yeah, design I can that answer you that. want it to be. Yeah. yeah, I would say Habitat, my firstborn, my first child, <laughs> is by far first the child. maybe most influential. The National Gallery right. of Canada, National Gallery of Canada in, uh, yeah. in Ottawa. Um, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem. Uh, the Sikh Museum. Of course, I can't not mention Marina Bay Sands because it became so explosively significant in Asia. And uh, just as I say that, I say, well, what about Crystal Bridges and what about the, the Skirball Center in Los yes. Angeles? So <laughs> I have a, a few children I love. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So how do you think today's technology is computational tools, artificial intelligence, like, and robots that we have begun to uh, show up in construction processes will affect architecture in the upcoming years? I think these are amazing tools. Uh, beginning from computer-aided design, amazing tool, but it's a tool. We have to remember, it's as good as what we input. It can't do it for us. It doesn't solve problems for us. It just helps us. And then going into new construction, I have two minds of that. On one part, materials have hardly changed. Since we built Habitat 50 right. years ago, it's still concrete, steel, glass, you know, is not a big radical change in the material of construction. But 3D printing and fabrication technology is changing very rapidly. And what that allows us to do is to design more complex buildings, not in terms of just shape, but in terms of responding, like making them more like nature, making them more fit into, you can design walls that change their transparency and all kinds of technologies that, that can make design more uh, like nature. Right. Great. Uh, we have another question from one of our audience. Uh, what Uday Pratrap asks, what are the elements you think are important in public interventions or public architecture? Uh, I, I, I need a little more detail, meaning what? Like public, public, art, public spaces, public architecture, like doing uh, an art gallery or doing like a cultural center? What are the uh, most uh, elements? Cultural you, institutions. Yeah. Well, to me, yes. cultural institutions have changed. Uh, they used to be elitist. They used to be very exclusive. Uh, you thought of a museum as a kind of a, a private place. 
today libraries like we did the Salt Lake Library, uh, uh, museums like the National Gallery are completely open, uh, inviting uh, part of the city. Uh, they also draw a lot of events and social gatherings that go beyond just the function of the library or the function of the museum. Even courthouses, right. even uh, buildings that have to do with, uh, with government are much more open, much more inviting, much more part of the city. And we need to push this further because it enriches the city to have these as more extrovert buildings than the old style introvert buildings. That's great. We have another question from one of our audience, which they emailed us. Uh, in the er Kate asks, uh, in the era that we are living, besides challenges like COVID-19, human race is struggling with other challenges like global warming, overpopulation in cities, and food supplies. With this situation, in the upcoming years, how will these challenges affect architecture and urban planning? Well, you get to the point where architecture cannot solve the birth rate or the population. That's that's for us to solve as citizens. So it's important right. to remember what we need to solve as citizens and what we need to solve as architects. But as architects, there's no question that we have to deal with bigger population, greater densities, and, and much more concentration in cities. And our job is to make this more humane, uh, concentrate of, on issues of three-dimensional planning of the city, how to bring light and air into the city, but also to be an influence. We have to be an influence. For example, I think it's time for us to say, sometimes too much density is not good. We should start reducing densities. We should start thinking of new modes of transportation that allow us for more efficient cities. Uh, methods that will uh, help us to, for example, deal with the whole problem of congestion and pollution. So we, have, we are players, but we need to be both planners and architects while we are also being citizens, because a lot of it citizens. is political. Architects yeah, should exactly. be political. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So who or what were your biggest influencers and uh, influences in architecture? Well, I would say that in terms of contemporary architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright has certainly been a constant inspiration because I think in terms of the experience of architecture, the whole question of nature and, and indoor outdoor, he, he was a pioneer. Uh, he wasn't a great urbanist, but he was a great pioneer of architecture. Uh, of course, for me, Louis Kahn has a special place. Uh, I worked for him. He was my, he's my mentor. And I, I learned a great deal for him, not only about how to, about the nature of architecture, but how to be an architect. Uh, an architect who gave equal importance to the sketch, to the detail, to the mock-up, to the supervision of construction. The whole process is making architecture. Um, but you know, I would also mention um, a little book called Architecture Without Architects by Bernard Rudofsky uh, from an exhibition they did at uh, MoMA right, in New York. Right. I've learned a great deal from the hill towns of Italy and the villages of Greece and the Middle East, I, from Iran, from the desert towns of Iran, for example. Uh, vernacular architecture is the most enriching uh, in the sense that it has evolved to respond to climate, to technology, to lifestyle in the most uh, wholesome way. Impressive, right. So uh, I'm sure that we have a lot of Iranian audience in here. And I would like to ask about, uh, I've heard that you had some projects in Iran before, before uh, like uh, a couple of years ago. Would you please talk a little bit about these projects? Well, I... I've and you have Iran. a lot of fans in Iran. You have a lot of fans. Well, and I'm a fan of Iran. I think I learned <laughs> a lot about architecture in Iran. Uh, Thank you. To, to me, the Friday Mosque in Isfahan is one of the great 
buildings of all times and uh, and the Thank villages uh, the villages uh, the desert villages uh, have been an inspiration I, I made a wonderful trip yes. Uh, through Iran with Aldo Van Eyck after the Persepolis conference in, I think it was uh, 1973 or something like that. But yeah, after right. that Persepolis conference, uh, we had two projects. One was a Tehran habitat, which uh, uh, was underway. And the other was a city in Senegal being built by Iran, which was about uh, refinery, oil, phosphates, a new city that actually we broke grounds on. Uh, and then, of, of course, uh, when the revolution occurred, everything came to an end. So neither got uh, uh, realized. But I spent many years coming in and out of Iran, and I have a great deal of affection for the culture and the history. Yeah, thank you. Many Iranian fans really love you. And they send me messages, especially to thank you to Mush dear Musha Safti and send regards, please. And thank you. Thank and you. I'll just go to my other, thank you. I'll go to my other question. What inspires you, dear Musha Safti? You know, we're inspired by many things, but for me, the most inspiring is, is studying and understanding how design evolves in nature. Many years ago, I was introduced to a book uh, called uh, uh, On Growth and Form. It was a book by Darcy Thompson of the, which invented the science of morphology. And he would look at the spider web or he would look at the shell and he would say, why is this the way it is? How did it evolve? How, why is the form? What is about the fitness? And I think studying, you look at the tree, you see how the tree works, you learn about architecture. You look at uh, any, any kind of uh, adaptive system in nature, the whole evolutionary uh, process of design teaches you about how architecture should evolve, how the form should evolve out of these considerations. Yeah, right. We have a question from one of our audience right now. I will ask, uh, Jiha Arch asks, can, habit can Habitat project be built today as prefect project right now or 3D printed with today's technology? I think that the, first of all, Habitat was based on three-dimensional modules. And we learned that the transportation problems are very difficult, so I think the industrialization process now is not going to be 3D elements, but more 2D assembly of smaller pieces. Uh, I don't think 3D printing is yet relevant. It's relevant to component parts, but not to the architecture scale. But I think that there are going to be technologies emerging that will allow for the assembly of component parts to be more efficient than they've been up to now. We certainly have to crack that problem of how to create a construction industry where you don't do everything three times. As an architect, I know I go right. to the site, ha everything happens twice because the first time is done wrong. Right, right. Uh, how, you, how do you describe your architecture and what is good architecture for you? I think to describe my architecture, I leave to others. Let them describe my architecture. Uh, I just do my thing. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> what do I consider to be good architecture? I'd say I have a few tests. One test is, does it feel good and work well 25 years after it was built? Don't judge a building when it opens. Go back 20 years later. How has it weathered? How has the technology survived? How has it adapted to the way people use it or vice versa? Does it feel still fresh? Uh, when I go to Habitat in Montreal today, my first building, one of the most uh, exciting thing for me is that it feels fresh. Right? You could, could have been yesterday, yesterday, you still feel okay about it. So when architecture starts feeling dated, you know that it's about fashion and not about wholesomeness. I think another criteria is, does it use resources efficiently? I learned that from Buckminster Fuller. 
uh, the more efficient we are about the way we build, the more responsive we are to the needs of people. In other words, the more we can provide to people. So doing a very fancy, complex building that takes extraordinary amount of money to realize uh, or resources is to me less exciting than doing it with limited means. And finally, the uh, uh, test is, does it feel like it belongs in the place? And do the people who are using it, if you're doing a school, if you're doing housing, if you're doing a performing arts center, do the people, uh, uh, does the program seem to respond, the building respond to the program of what it was intended for? You know, sometimes you see a building, it's a school, oh, what exciting shapes. And then you go, you see that, that the kids are not comfortable, that the light is not so good. I think the test is the livability of a building. That's another test. Does it feel like it's doing it? Right, brilliant, awesome. So how do you imagine the future for your own practice? Well, I'm 82, almost, not quite. Um, I have a wonderful team. Uh, you know, with the years you learn uh, how to organize an office how to get everybody to feel that uh, that they are productive and creative within a team effort uh the nice thing is you know we are probably 80 90 people and we're doing billions so we know how to do it and i hope that uh as uh, uh i disappear from the picture that they will continue with uh, the same similar principles and, and ambitions uh, to, to build on everything we've learned in the last 50 years. And as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I'll keep going as long as I'm breathing. I'm enjoying it uh, and I don't intend <laughs> to stop. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Uh, are there any other architects that you admire their work? like to, uh, the living architects? I feel a great affinity with the work of Renzo Piano. Uh, I think we have similar sensibilities. Uh, I think he's very sensitive to location, to place, uh, and to technology. Um, I've uh, um, enjoyed many of the buildings of Norman Foster and the whole culture of design that had, had been developed by uh, by, by the by the firm um, and then there's architects I admire where we're very different you know Frank Gehry is a very close friend our work couldn't be more different uh, we I think learned a lot from each other and I see what he's exploring and enjoy it and admire it even though we're very different yeah great Great, awesome, thank you. Uh, we have another question from one of our audience and this is the last question I'm getting from the audiences. Uh, I get this one as email as well. Asli asks, uh, you have always talked about the role of architects in society and the responsibilities that architects have. As an architect, how do you define your responsibility for the society? I think somehow you answered this question, but if you want to just explain it more, we can hear it. I'll, I'll answer it briefly. First, I, something I say to my students. Every time you take a pencil to draw, and I hope people still take pencils and not just work on the computer. So when you take the pen or the pencil to draw, think of become the person you're designing for or the people you're designing for. Forget about yourself. Think about them. That's the first uh, step to victory. And uh, so it seems to me that it's about really compassion for those you design for. That an architect, uh, we're all about self-expression, we're all about ego, we can't help ourselves, but fundamentally, when it all comes down, you are designing for those who are going to experience your architecture and you have to have them in your, in your head. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, awesome, thank you. Thank you. So uh, as closer with all these experiences you had in architecture profession, I would like to ask about what kind of advice would you like to share with young professionals, students, who are, who, to those ones who are 
new in this profession. What kind of advice would you like to share with them? I, I guess my main advice is, it's a, that, is that you have to have compassion, passion about being an architect. It's a tough profession. We tend to be Uh, dear Moshe Safti, I think we lost your. Hear me? Uh, I think we lost like uh, 10 seconds of your talking. Can you just go? Do you hear me, dear Moshe? Do you hear me? I hear you right now. Okay. I said that I believe we need to have a great passion to be architects, that it's a tough journey, that there's a lot, you've got to go a long way before you realize your dreams as an architect. So you have to be very committed. And I think you also have to be very multifaceted. Hmm? Sorry? Can you hear me? Uh, we hear you still. Yeah, okay. I, I hear you. I hear you. Okay. I hear you. If you want to continue, yeah, we can continue. Okay. So we, uh, I think the the other advice I have for architects is, uh, think of it as the most integrative endeavor of many many disciplines. It's about construction. It's about politics, it's about sociology. It's, architecture is about getting a full appreciation of many, many fields that feed into it. So it is the least specialized profession I can think of. And with that in mind, that's the way you should also be studying and exploring things. You are a builder, but you're also other things. Yeah, awesome, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, one last question that I would like to ask from one of our audience. Uh, Zira, Zira Arch asked, what is your opinion about future cities? And how is, yeah, what is your, about, uh, your, your, your opinion about future cities? We need another hour, one hour to answer the question. <laughs> uh, I think Just very city, briefly. I think, we are going to see a complete transformation of transportation in the city. It will begin by having cars which we don't own, like on demand, eventually driverless cars. It will, begin, it will follow also very efficient public transportation with good interface. That will change the form of cities. They'll be able to spread more and extend more. We'll see more mix of high density, medium and low density. And I think, I hope we'll get a rediscovery of the public realm, how to create very wonderful places for people to meet in the city. As far as the dense part of cities, I think we're gonna have much more three dimensional planning, streets in the air, connections at various levels, no more just street with individual buildings, but more three dimensional planning and construction. Awesome, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing conversation with us. I really appreciate it. Do you have any final words to share with our audience? Well, it's been a pleasure and all of us should keep optimistic. COVID has been a tough moment, but let's keep it as a good teacher. Let's not forget the lessons of COVID when we go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Stay safe and goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Guys, thank you so much for, for watching this live session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to continue with more live sessions like this. Uh, till then, stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye. <laughs>